Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. This is truly an honour and pleasure to be here. And I dedicate this lecture to my mum, who died of breast cancer in 2009, and we went through a horrible journey together. And whenever I did things like this that I was particularly proud of, and I'm very proud of being here today, I'd always phone mum and say, you know, I'm doing this, oh, that's good, that's good. And I couldn't do that this time. So that's why this is dedicated to, to mum. What I want to try and do, and it's a sort of long story, this, I want to lead you through a lot of science. Now, we're going to lock the doors to keep you in, because if I start talking science, people sometimes start leaving. So could you please lock the doors, ladies in pink? Or at least stand by them and stop these people leaving. But when I show molecular structures, I'm going to show a lot of molecular structures. Don't be frightened away if you're not a Nobel laureate chemist. Some of you might be, some of you might not be. Because I would just want you to look at the shapes of these molecules, because it's the shapes that are important. Because I want to tell you about the way some of these molecules interact with people, with their bodies. And towards the end, after I've told you that story, I want to begin to focus in how these might be having an effect in the development of breast cancer. But the latter bit, a lot of it's speculation. A lot of it's just beginning to be understood. But it's something that we need to all be very well aware of, because I think that's the future of where we're going, basically, in looking at breast cancer and what it is. So with the, what I'm going to try and cover today is what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And these are the chemicals that I'm very interested in, the chemicals that interact with the female hormone receptor that we think might be having an involvement in the development of breast cancer. I want to talk about what they are and how we're exposed to them. Are they affecting us? That's a big question. And I'm glad I've got a whole six hours to talk to you today <laughs> because I'm going to need that. Uh, I think. What are their effects? And could they cause breast cancer? That's a big word. And if so, what's the evidence? There's quite a lot happening out there in the environment at the moment. And I just want to quickly run through some of those things. Some of them, my students, whenever I show this, decide to kill themselves laughing. And we've had actually students <coughs> leaving lectures because they're in laughter at this stage. But there's a serious, serious bit behind it. Alligators' penises are getting shorter. And there's been some very interesting studies carried out by Louis Gouillet in America in around about 1992, published in 1996, that began this story. To cut a long story short, this decrease in the length of the alligator's penises is due to environmental pollution by chemicals that interfere with testosterone, chemicals that are estrogenic, that look like estrogen. That was the beginning of this target. Only 1996 it was published. I began working in the area in around about 1992 as well. So we've come a long way in a short time. The human sperm count is decreasing. Now, that doesn't matter too much from the perspective of breast cancer. But why I want to talk about it a little bit today is because it pre presents the evidence that these chemicals are affecting our bodies. And it presents the evidence that they're affecting our bodies in a way that they could be involved in the etiology of breast cancer. So a lot of the evidence I'll give today is not about breast cancer specifically, but it's other evidence that can be linked. And I hope that'll become clear as we go along. Male trout are expressing a protein called vitellogenin. Now, you might think, well, what does that matter? Well, vitellogenin is a female egg protein. Males shouldn't be producing it. So clearly, there's something peculiar going on there, too. Girls are reaching puberty earlier, and that's because estrogen stimulate the development of pu puberty. At the point of puberty, estrogen levels go up. And if you raise estrogen levels synthetically with xenoestrogens before the natural increase in estrogen levels, you could also stimulate puberty then. And that's thought to be the reason for this. There's controversy about this. I speak about it as if it's definite. It isn't definite. There's still argument. But the argument is subsiding and acceptance is beginning to creep in rather nicely. French oysters aren't breeding and that's very sad indeed because oysters are aphrodisiacs for the French. And if the aphrodisiacs aren't breeding, that's not very good for the French. And I put this one on especially for today because the breast cancer rate began to increase in around about 1980. It went up to a peak in around about 2002. It's difficult to see from the data. And it's sort of plateaued and just gently declining now. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to think, oh, oh thank God for that, we're OK. What it means is perhaps that that period represented a previous exposure. And we're now getting some of these exposures to some extent under control by monitoring and looking at environmental pollution. Just look at that breast cancer instance so we can just focus in what we're talking about. And you can see this sort of increase and then plateauing. And just here, 
around about 2003, 4, there's a begin, beginning of a decline. I should have put the later data on. I'm sorry, I didn't. It declines even further now, which is very, very good news indeed. Let's just have a, a look at how estrogen works, because before I can talk about estrogenicity and what estrogens are and how xenoestrogens might work, you just need to have an understanding of how estrogens work. For those of you out there that know this, I'm really sorry, but we'll go through it uh, reasonably quickly. So all women and all men produce steroid hormones, and all women and all men produce estrogens. Women produce a lot of it, men produce a bit of it. As I always tell my students, estrogen is the hormone that makes you look beautiful, and that's the sort of thing you have to say when there's mainly women in the audience. And I don't say that so much when there's men in the audience. We go around that one quite quickly. And this estrogen, 17-beta estradiol, the female hormone, interacts with a receptor in the cell, which is a protein with a particular shape. I'll talk about that in a minute. And when it interacts with that receptor, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a minute too, it goes along to the DNA and switches on a whole load of protein synthesis. And this is basically the protein synthesis associated with feminization of a cell. That's a very glib oversimplification of a whole load of biochemistry. But for our purposes, I think that's probably okay for now. We'll look at it in a bit more detail then. So you can regard the estrogen receptor and the estrogen molecule as a sort of lock and key, where the shape of the estrogen molecule fits the shape of the receptor. And when those two are fitted, when the receptor recognizes the estrogen molecule, it goes away and off to DNA and does its job. And here's the estrogen molecule, just to get us used to the shape of it. And you can see it's got a very characteristic shape. And it's that shape, this side actually, which I'll show you in a minute, that fits into uh, the receptor. So it's a simple, very clever process that took many, many years to evolve. You can't see that very well, and my PhD student that drew the diagram will be mortified because it took six months of her life to do this. But this is actually a reconstructed uh, estrogen receptor, and she's actually compiled it using a rather fancy uh, computer program and all of the individual amino acids of the um, receptor protein. And the program actually puts them into exactly the right place. But what you can see, probably just about here, is an estrogen molecule, because this is taken from some studies with estrogen actually in that receptor. So we can see exactly where it binds. And you can look at that in a little bit more detail, and here it is, and there's the estrogen molecule there sitting in that receptor, sitting in that lock, and there's the key. And estrogen basically is the key that opens that lock. So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, and it's quite important to understand this, because when I begin to talk about xenoestrogens, you need to know how they fit in and what they cause, the effects that they actually cause. So here we've got a simple representation. Uh, this is taken from a book that's just, I've just finished it actually, it's just gone to the publishers. And it was the happiest day of my life. We used to put it in an envelope and it was fantastic when you sent the big parcel off. But now you just press a button, it's not quite as ceremonial. But I pressed the button, gone. Uh, it's just gone, it'll be out in, in uh, January I think. Here's a representation of the estrogen receptor. Here's the estrogen receptor site. Here's estrogen. It binds to it. It changes the shape of that molecule a little bit, which, mean, which means that two of them can actually join together. And when the two join together, the sequence of protein on the bottom here is the bit that DNA recognizes and initiates that upregulation. So you've got to have that whole process going on. You don't need to know that detail, but that whole process is important for what I'm going to talk about. If you look at a little bit more detail of that lock and key, so we can get down to grips with what bit, which bits of the molecule are important. So this is a really sim too simple, actually. Simplistic representation of that lock and key. And here's the estrogen molecule sitting in there. And the bits that are important are this long, knobbly bit in the middle, which repels water, it's hydrophobic, and that interacts with specific amino acids in this bit of the receptor. And these hydroxyl groups at each end um, interact with other bits of the receptor. And if they're the right distance apart, and that's there as the spacer, then it will switch on the estrogen receptor. So any molecule with that sort of shape will do pretty well the same thing. And you can get really, I can get really technical on you now, and we're very proud of these sort of things. I'll pretend we did this, we didn't. We've taken this out of the literature. But it's a, it's a representation of that center of the estrogen molecule, but taken from a real estrogen receptor molecule occupied by a real estrogen molecule using a process called X-ray crystallography, which was the process used to determine the structure of DNA, actually. And you can see here the estrogen molecule sitting there, and you can see, look, 
that the, this is the hydroxyl group I talked about, that OH at the top, you can see it's interacting here, and you can see the other OH at the bottom is interacting down here, and we're not showing the interactions here, but there are interactions here as well. And what actually happens is, I wasn't going to tell you this, but it's, I think it's brilliant, is when that and that interact with that and that, they pull them together very slightly. And when they pull them together, this bit of protein here just slightly contracts. And that contraction is amplified across the whole molecule to cause a slight change in the shape, which means a bit of protein is exposed that isn't normally, which allows the two receptors to join together. Just that tiny change. It's a tiny one or two nanometers, 10 to the minus 9 meters uh, change. You don't need the detail, but quite fascinating, I think. So the whole reason for this is because there are two really quite sexy molecules out there. Now, you're all, most of you are women, so I think you can take this. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, sex a bit now. So these are the two really important molecules. And these are the molecules that uh, the receptor's trying to distinguish between. Here's estrogen. I've covered the naughty bits because I didn't think we could deal with that straight away. And here's the male hormone, testosterone. So I've covered the male naughty bits as well. But if you feel up to it, are you up to it? There they are. This is a full frontal hormone. Has anybody, faint, has anybody fainted? <laughs> but if you look at the difference, there's not much, is there, basically? So the estrogen receptor is designed to re receive that, and it will not, well, it does a bit, actually, it will not receive this. And if you look at it, just at the chemistry, without knowing any chemistry necessarily, it's easy to see there's a difference there, it looks different to that, but the rest of it is pretty well the same. So the estrogen receptor distinguishes between that and that and pretty well nothing else. And when it evolved, that was the way the world was. It didn't have any interfering molecules. And then along came the Industrial Revolution, put a whole load of new molecules out there. We're making thousands of new molecules a year. And the estrogen receptor got confused. It had been designed simply to distinguish between those. And suddenly we had a whole load of molecules that looked a bit like this. Well, the estrogen receptor thought, in quotes, it's estrogen. You know, I'm designed to recognize this. And that's where the problems uh, began. So just looking at those two molecules, I'm very proud of these diagrams because my students can all use this uh, program called ChemDraw. And they sort of like, like on their iPhones, they just go like this. Well, this has taken me three years to master. <laughs> and I can actually now superimpose different colored molecules. And you didn't even clap at that. <laughs> My undergraduate students will be banging on the seats and roaring at this stage because they know the difficulties I've had in trying to learn this. I'm not very technologically able. So just to, uh, to illustrate that uh, rather better, I think, there's testosterone in the blue colour, blue for boys, and there's uh, oestrogen in the red colour, pink for girls, really, I suppose. And there's the difference, basically, that, uh, that you can see. So it's a very small uh, difference. But there are, as I said, there are a whole load of chemicals out there that began being produced in the Industrial Revolution and have gone on great guns since then. And this, is, this actually does require a very great round of applause for my students because I've got three colors here and they're all superimposed. And in the background, we've got estrogen and then I've got two molecules on the top here. This is, a, I'm gonna talk about them more. That's a molecule called bisphenol A and this is a molecule called genistein. And you don't need to be a Nobel laureate chemist to see that they've all got these groups in around about the same place. They're not identical, but they're around about at both ends. And they've all got this long bit in the middle. And the estrogen receptor will receive them all. And it will bind them all. And it will respond to them all. But it doesn't respond to them as well as it does to estrogen. And that's the ultimate key. So it's a bit like having these other molecules, the green one and the purple one, are a bit like a key with a few of the, the um, teeth missing. So, you know, you need to shove it in the lock and just waggle it around a bit to get it to work. And it probably doesn't work quite as well. That's exactly what this is. These hormone mimics can have all sorts of names, and I'll, and I'll oscillate from one to the other. Um, endocrine disruptors uh, is a group, and this really relates to any molecule that interferes with the endocrine system. Because not only do these molecules interfere with estrogen production, they can interfere with testosterone, they can interfere with thyroid hormones, but I'm not going to talk about those at all today. But I'm rather interested in the thyroid hormone ones as well. Or they're sometimes called estrogen mimics, or xenoestrogen, xeno being from the Greek for foreign. So they're foreign estrogens, basically. There's a question I need to pose before we get into some of these molecules and where they come from, and that is why does it appear that these molecules have a 
uh, a greater effect in post, uh, a, a less effect in post puberty premenopausal uh, women? And that's quite an interesting question because people in the middle of, women in the middle of their lives are very much less affected by these molecules than those before, i.e., they cause early puberty, or those later, they might be involved in uh, the etiology of breast cancer. And if we look at the hormone levels, estrogen levels in, in your average woman, they are going up and down according to the position in the estrogen cycle, obviously. If you look at the levels in a man, they're around about, uh, this is a bit of a generalization, around about 20 nanograms per litre in the blood, and they're pretty standard. They don't change very much at all. But before um, puberty, women have a roundabout, or girls have a roundabout, the men's level of hormone, a bit higher actually. And post-puberty, they have a roundabout, uh, the men's level of hormone. Again, a little bit lower, and it, higher, and it declines uh, over years. So if you give a chemical that resembles the female hormone, and you give it during this period of a woman's life, she's used to those changes. And the, that chemical that you're giving is a drop in the ocean compared with these huge levels of estrogen the woman can have. But if you give it before puberty, it then isn't a drop in the ocean, it's a significant dose, and that might have a pharmacological effect like uh, making the age of puberty earlier. If you give it later in life, it's exactly the same. Or if you give it to men at any time in their life, they will probably have an effect. So men are affected all the time. Women basically before and after, uh, uh, before puberty and after um, the menopause. Let's have a little bit more detailed look at some of these molecules, where they come from and how they work. Now we've got sort of the basics uh, out of the way. Does this make some sort of sense? Good. Anyone sleep yet? No, good. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> oh, I'm doing well. Ten minutes and then not to sleep. <laughs> I always count my undergraduate students. I'm, I, I time to the first yawn. And uh, it's usually about 15 minutes. But I managed 30 minutes the other day. And as soon as I mention it, everybody starts yawning. It's so funny. It's a psychological... You'll all yawn now. It's a psychological thing. So let's look at them then. Here's 17 beta estradiol, the main female hormone. And here are the other compounds, genistain from soy and bisphenol A from uh, plastics, and a molecule I'm rather interested in that I'll talk about, which is called hydroxy uh, non-alphenol, and I'll talk about that more. There are many more molecules like this, but I'm not going to talk about all of them because we'd be here, we would really be here all day, and I'm not allowed to do that. So let's have a look at the polycarbonate plastics first, and these are the plastics that are used for the manufacture of um, the sort of things that you put your food in, basically. Some of the things that you might put your sandwiches in. Also, some of these hard drinking bottles that are sometimes used are made from polycarbonate plastics. They're also used, you can't see this very well, but they're used to line the inside of tin cans. And I don't think you can see this. I can't from here. Some of these sort of white, have you seen the sort of white linings inside cans? That's a polycarbonate plastic lacquer. It's now been, some of them have been changed now. That they're no longer white, they're transparent. Because the white is actually due to a pigment to make it look better. And I think the companies decided that you didn't like that being there, and so they've made it transparent now, so you don't think it's there. So that's probably very unfair, actually, but I think it's probably quite close to the truth. <laughs> so if you look inside the cans, they've got that shiny look. They've probably got uh, polycarbonate. And polycarbonate is made from this molecule, bisphenol A, and it's polymerized. doesn't matter about this, but it's just so you know. It's polymerized uh, to make a plastic, which is a great, great long chain of this. And if, th if that molecule this phenol A, is all incorporated into one of these big chains. That's great. It's not going anywhere. It's not breaking down. It's going to have no effect on you whatsoever. But any free molecule, as you can see, looks rather like 17-beta estradiol. It's got the hydroxyls in the right place, the right separation, and that can have an effect on you. Just as an aside, I've got a student at the moment working on this, and she's been looking at different plastics. And we found that some plastics leach a lot more of this than other plastics. And she's done that by putting fat inside some of these tubs and just leaving it for a while and seeing if she can measure this in the fat because this is quite fat soluble and she found some of them were so we decided to investigate this a little bit further and it turns out that this is a sweeping generalization but we have just published it and it got through a journal so it can't be that sweeping and it can't be that much of a generalization it turned out that the imported plastics are more likely to have free um, bisphenol A than the New Zealand manufactured plastics and now New Zealand doesn't manufacture, well it does, but very few plastics are manufactured in New Zealand now. 
we buy all of our plastics in from places like China, and they're reformed in New Zealand to make the shape, basically. So I suspect we're going to get an increase in our exposure to bisphenol A. The issue is bad enough for the Canadian government to have banned uh, bisphenol A in babies' bottles because of the developmental effects that they perceive will happen. But I can't go into that story, it's a long story, but it's very significant that the government has banned uh, the use of this compound. There's a big call in New Zealand to look more closely at it, and I, I support that. I'm not for banning things, but I'm for reducing their use if they might have an impact. It's also, just so you know, the, the plastic that's in my glasses, and if you've got those very nice white fillings so that when you open your mouth it doesn't look all black, um, they're also bisphenol A plastic, and the dentist actually injects into the tooth bisphenol A, and then he puts a UV light over it, and it polymerizes to form the plastic. So dentists are actually quite exposed to this at the moment. So just looking at bisphenol A, just to make the point, here's the red is bisphenol A, and the black is uh, the 17 beta estradiol. You can see nice lineup. And uh, if you take that one stage further into one of my flashy pictures, you can see it fits nicely. This is, this is a real estrogen receptor that's been crystallized in the presence of bisphenol A x-ray crystallography done with a very fancy computer that can solve that x-ray crystallograph and show you the shape of the protein and the molecules associated with it. We didn't do this. This is out of the literature. You can see it sits in there, but it doesn't interact very well at this end. So it's not such a good key for that lock, but it interacts very well at that end, so it does uh, open, uh, open that lock. Genistane, another one which, which is an important one. These are the two main estrogenic compounds that have been studied extensively. There are many more, but these are the main uh, two. This is present in soybeans, and you can see, you know, you're getting good at this now, I should imagine. You're all becoming really good chemists. You look at that, and it's obvious, isn't it? You know, it's got the two hydroxyls, one on each end, and it's got that bit in the middle. That's bad news. That makes it a little bit less hydrophobic, water repelling, which means that it's not quite such a good lock. It, the key for the lock. It's around about... Um, 10,000th of the activity of, uh, of 17 beta estradiol. And there it is, lined up quite nicely in one of my very proud uh, diagrams. And one of the issues, of course, is that, you know, if I asked you the question, but you know the answer probably now, how many people have eaten soy today? Uh, my students would all say, well, I don't eat oh, bloody soy, I don't eat soy. Soy's not for men, don't eat that. But we, we put soy flour into our bread in New Zealand and in many countries in the world. Between 20 and 30% of the flour in bread is soy flour. So there's quite a lot of um, uh, genistein present in the bread. We do that, apparently, I was talking to a baker the other day. Uh, we do it because New Zealand flour doesn't have as much um, protein. It's got a lower protein level. And uh, it, it means that the bread doesn't form that nice sort of squashy texture. So we add a bit of extra protein to it to help that uh, along. New Zealand flour is quite low in gluten, which is the, which is the protein that actually holds, uh, holds the bread together. So we add a bit more. And soy is very cheap as well, so that's quite, a, uh, quite useful. But we are getting exposed uh, to genestin in that way. Just a little aside while we're at this, postmenopausal women can benefit, of course, from doses of these chemicals. Because at the menopause, when the estrogen level goes down, you're, you're sort of in simple parlance. And we've got experts in the front row here. I shouldn't talk about this. But... You, you sort of get withdrawal from estrogen. And so if you get a bit of estrogen replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy, it makes you feel better because that with those withdrawal symptoms disappear. So if you eat bread, for example, containing genistein, <coughs> or breads particularly rich in genistein, and some companies make them, adding linseed to the bread, which is very rich in uh, estrogenic compounds, that can also sometimes ameliorate the symptoms of, um, of the menopause. And why I say that, it is important to recognise that these things are not all bad. There is a good side to them as well. And it would be unfair of me just to, tell, to paint a very, very negative picture that means that you all go outside and we've got banners <coughs> outside, you know, ban genistein. We shouldn't. We should use these things properly and regulate them properly to make sure that exposure is optimal. Let's just have a little bit of a look at the effects of these things on developing children. Because again, that's not the purpose of our seminar today, but it shows some of the evidence that shows how they can work. And the evidence that shows that they do do the things that we're predicting that they do. And that's really rather important. 
I've talked about this quite a bit over the last few years because I'm becoming quite interested in it. And the work that I do at the Liggins Institute um, in Auckland is very much related to all of this. If you, if you look at a, a pregnant woman, the, the little nippers sitting in there in the uterus, connected, we, we all, you know this better than me actually, uh, connected to the placenta by the umbilical cord, and basically the, the mother's circulatory system is providing that uh, little nipper with its uh, nutrients and taking away its waste products. A very good service you provide, thank you very much indeed, mums. Um, you've done it for us all. The issue is that that placenta has to try and minimise the crossing of molecules that might cause the child damage. And of course that's evolved over many, many years. One of the molecules that can cause the child quite significant damage is oestrogen itself. Now you lot are full of the stuff. So when you're pregnant, somehow this placenta's got to modulate the amount of oestrogen getting across to the developing child. And it does that by two mechanisms. One having what's called a placental barrier, which is a, it's not a physical barrier, it's a biochemical barrier, which actually pumps oestrogen out. And the second is by having processes to metabolize oestrogen in the placenta by adding onto it a big group called glucuronic acid, actually, it doesn't matter what it is, which stops it going across into the child. At certain times, those barriers are modified when oestrogen is required and it's allowed across. Complex story, I don't understand it myself. Peter Gluckman's the man that really understands this sort of stuff and he tells me about it at every single dinner party I go to that we have to sit <laughs> next to. And I've never actually learned it just because I'm not going to. That's it, full stop. So let's just have a little bit of a look at what might happen here with some of these uh, chemicals. And if you look at genistain and BPA, we've done some really quite interesting experiments at the ligands um, in collaboration with, with Peter, actually, and a, a really brilliant uh, PhD student, um, Balakrishnan, who, um, Bijou Balakrishnan, who is probably this big. And he, he never minds me saying this, a little Indian man, he's the most fantastic little guy. And he has been collecting the placenta from women at the point of parturition, running back to the lab. And to see him do this is just amazing. He comes running down the corridor, does the whole thing in three minutes, runs down the corridor, takes the placenta out and cannulates it so that you can put a cannula on the baby's side and on the mum's side and circulate a synthetic blood around both of those sides. Then you can inject things into the mother's side and see if they appear in the baby's side. Quite clever, this. And uh, really quite impressive. And these graphs really don't do justice to what um, Bijou's done, because each of these experiments is really quite, takes a lot of setting up and a lot of ingenuity and speed to get it to work properly. So if you look at this, here's genistain. This is the level of genistain in the mother's side, and it's going down. And here's the level in the baby's side, and it's going up. So it's clear, because the slopes of those two graphs are around about the same, that genistain just passes straight across the placenta without any worry at all. If you look at BPA, it's exactly the same. It goes straight across the placenta. I haven't shown a graph, perhaps I should. If you put 17 beta estradiol, the female hormone in there, it doesn't go across. It's not simple actually. It's not a dead straight line. It goes down and comes back up again, but it doesn't go across. And that's because the placenta is protected. But the thing is, the placenta is protecting the baby. The placenta doesn't recognize that, and it doesn't recognize that as things that shouldn't be crossing. And that's one of the problems with all of the biochemistry around this, is that the molecules like this are recognized as self, as good as what the body needs, rather than being uh, synthetic and bad. Another molecule that I'm rather interested in, I want to tell you this story because it shows how we go about looking at these molecules and deciding whether they might be estrogenic or whether they might have some of the effects that uh, I'm talking about. And this is a molecule called 4-nonolphenol, and I've got a picture here which I've been told off about actually by the company, uh, because it used to be, and the word used to be, or the phrase used to be is very important, it used to be present or used in Mr. Muscle, one of the cleaners. And it's a very, very powerful detergent. It was banned about five years ago because it's estrogenic. But nobody knew why it was estrogenic. And so I decided that I'd get a PhD student to try and look at this and see if we could explain why it's uh, estrogenic. Because if you look at its molecular structure, you know, you've now graduated at 300-level uh, chemistry and we'll be giving you the degree certificate on the way out. The vice chancellor's out there ready um, with all the certificates. 
mean, you, 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 you'd know quite clearly that that doesn't look like the other molecules. You know, that end of it might, but this end of it certainly doesn't. I went to a meeting in Glasgow, oh, I don't know, uh, five, six, seven years ago and gave a paper predicting what might happen to non-alphenol, because there's a lot of conjecture about non-alphenol at the time. If you give it to animals, it does all the estrogen things. If you look at its structure, it can't be doing that. So lots of people were standing up at meetings saying, well, this is what I think is happening, and I did just that. So I stood up at this meeting in Glasgow and said, well, I think this is happening. I think it refolds to look like that. And then a hydroxyl group goes on the end, and then look, if you put them together, they match. And the audience sort of laughed a little bit, which is slightly embarrassing, because they said, well, you know, anyone can redraw a molecule looking like that and anybody can stick a hydroxyl on the end, and anyone can do that. So I thought, bugger them. I'm going to spend some of my life proving that I'm right. So luckily, I got a really good PhD student who's called Lisa Graham, who did that for me. And what she did was, she did quite a lot of very good work, which was published uh, just, just last year, in which she modelled the estrogen receptor very, very cleverly with a programme called Schrodinger 2008, which costs... $15,000, so it's not like a you know, little program you put in your computer. This is a serious one that we have to run on a supercomputer because it's so big. And even then, it takes 17 minutes to do the transformations to allow this sort of structure to come out. Now, I'll tell you that because it's not, it's not me manipulating this molecule. It's a very sophisticated, pro sophisticated program manipulating it. So what the program's done is it's taken the female hormone. Here it is, the brownie one, 17 beta estradiol. Forget the others for a bit and it's put it into the chemical environment of the estrogen receptor. And in fact, all the, the chemical environment of the estrogen receptor is all round here, but we've actually taken it out because you can't see these molecules when you've got all the amino acids of the estrogen receptor there. So we know that that's the optimum shape of 17-beta estradiol in the receptor. What it's then done, we've then given it non-alphenol and put a hydroxyl group on the other end of it, which is what the dispute is about, and said, well, what would that look like in that same environment? And look what it looks like. This has three different forms, the gray one, the green one, and the blue one, and it folds into exactly the right shape. So the estrogen receptor is actually able to change the shape of a molecule to look like estrogen. Oh my God, that's the worst possible thing you can have happen. So it can actually modify molecular structures to pull them into the right shape. And just so you know, if you put all of the amino acids back or some of them back again, you can see that that non-alphenol shape interacts in the receptor just like estrogen does. <coughs> it's about a ten thousandth of the activity of, uh, of estrogen. You might ask me, before I go into this, you might ask me why there's that hydroxyl group on the end. And why it's on the end is in your liver when you absorb non-alphenol, the liver, an enzyme in the liver, puts a hydroxyl group on the end. So that did it for me very nicely. And also in the environment, bacteria in rivers and streams, in the silt in rivers and streams, will do exactly the same thing. So probably, if you're absorbing non-alphenol from environmental contamination, you'll be absorbing it with the hydroxyl group on. And if you're not, you'll put it on yourself. So isn't that fantastic? We're doing this all for the Eastern receptor. Another one I want to talk about, again, this is all building up that evidence before we actually get to looking at what's happening, is oops, a molecule called um, dibutyl phthalate. And this is a chemical that was used extensively in plastics as a plasticizer. <coughs> and it was used because it, it causes the plastics to be nice and stretchy or more malleable. You, you know the sort of cling films you use in the kitchen? They used to contain very high um, amounts of dibutyl phthalate to make them stretchy. It's now been removed and replaced by adipic acid because dibutyl phthalate is now a recognized um, estrogenic compound and is banned in many uses. It's still used in some places, but it's banned in many uses. But again, you know, you look at its molecule, it looks nothing like estrogen at all, um, not in the slightest. But if you look how it's metabolized in the body, then it gets a little bit more worrying because what happens to it is it loses one of those side chains. Again, you don't need to worry about the chemistry here. It loses one of those side chains, and it gets a hydroxyl group on the end. But still, it doesn't look quite like estrogen. It can, we think, fit the estrogen receptor. Although I submitted a paper on this recently, and they got so upset about it that they rejected the paper until we modified it and put lots of mites and ifs and buts in there. 
but eventually it came out the other end. <coughs> so it can look like it, but it looks like something else. It looks like the hormone prednenolone. And if you line it up with prednenolone, you can really see some nice similarities there. And we now know from quite a lot of studies that have been carried out by a chap in the States called George Earl that indeed it does mimic prednenolone. And chemicals can mimic very many hormones, and this one actually mimics uh, the hormone prednenolone. But prednenolone is really quite important because it's a precursor for testosterone, and I'm going to come to that in a few minutes' time. But I want to tell you an example, a case of exposure to dibutyl phthalate, which has shown how it works. Again, evidence for effect of these chemicals, environmental chemicals or food-related uh, chemicals. The Malaysian war, which went on during the uh, Malaysian, or Malayan as it was called, emergency, 1950s to 1960, a lot of New Zealand soldiers there, and those New Zealand soldiers were exposed to dibutyl phthalate. And why they're exposed to dibutyl phthalate is it kills the chigas mite. And the chigas mite, I didn't know anything about this until we got called by uh, the New Zealand Malaysian Veterans Association who had heard something I did on the radio and said, you talked about this dibutyl phthalate stuff. You know, we were all exposed to it. And I got very excited because I'd never come across a group of people that had been exposed to it. So we decided to study them. The chigas mite actually carries a thing called scrub typhus. And that's a real problem for soldiers in jungle situations because it makes them a little bit ill. They get the sort of flu, they can actually die, but it's very rare. They get sort of flu type symptoms. That's not much good if you're fighting in a war. So they have to treat them in some way to get rid of the chigas mite. And the way they did it was they painted the seams of their clothes with a dibutyl phthalate. And the reason they did that, if you look at the seam, the seam, the seam of their clothes, you can sort of pull them slightly apart. And these chigas mites are pretty small. And they would actually go through those seams and just latch onto the skin of the soldiers. And then they would inject uh, the uh, caustive agent of scrub typhus into the soldiers. The problem is that the dibutyl phthalate is absorbed through the skin. So those soldiers every day were painting their clothes with dibutyl phthalate and every day were getting uh, exposed to it. Just so that you know it really did happen, and this is quite an interesting picture, I think. Somebody sent me this recently, and if you can read the writing, don't, because the spelling's so awful in it. It's a lovely old guy who is now 91, and he was involved in this, and he'd read something about this and sent me a picture. And this is actually he and his mates painting dibutyl phthalate onto their clothes in the Malayan emergency. It's never been shown in a photograph before. I think the first time I've ever shown it, it was fantastic. And look what they're doing. They're not bothering to paint it. They're putting their hands in and actually rubbing it onto the clothes. So their doses were huge, which is quite interesting. Just so that you know what it does, don't worry about all this molecular stuff, but just so that you know what it does. This is testosterone, basically. And it's synthesized by this big pathway called the glucocorticoid pathway. And here's prednenolone. And what we now know is that the dibutyl phthalate, looking like that, interferes with this enzyme, this enzyme, and this enzyme. And it stops the pathway going in this direction. So it reduces the amount of testosterone. So it changes the testosterone to estrogen ratio. Exactly the same would happen in women. It's exactly the same. You make testosterone as well. And it's the ratio of the two that's really important in determining sex or determining the division of uh, some cells. <coughs> won't go into the great details, but I've got a very clever student working on this at the moment, and she's beginning to show that it's not just that this interferes with the enzyme, it actually interferes with the genes that make the enzyme, and it switches off the gene that makes the enzyme. Amazing. I didn't expect that. But what does it do? It causes some disorders. So if you, if you decrease the level of testosterone, two disorders can occur, well, more than two, but these are two that we're interested in. One of them's hyperspadias, and this is when the urethra comes out of the side of the penis instead of the end, and the other's cryptorchidism, undescended testes, when the testes don't descend into the scrotum. They're both operable, they're both repairable, but they're indicators of changes in estrogen-testosterone ratios during development. Let's have a look why that's the case. You can probably see where I'm going with this because we've done a study on these people that were exposed and it became very interesting. What actually happened, this is so simple, I really apologise, but in the embryo, 
there's an area of the embryo before this stage, actually, but I thought I'd put a picture in there, uh, called the urogenital fold. And it's a little sort of fold of epithelial cells, which goes like this. And depending how it grows, it either produces a vagina or a penis. That's, again, very simplistic. But the growth is determined by which hormone it's exposed to. So in really simple terms, and Peter Gluckman has also given me a rather large lecture on this, which takes another two and a half hours if you'd like that one. I'll get him in. The urogenital fold, if it's affected by androgens like testosterone, then you're affected to produce the boy organs. If it's um, affected by estrogens, you effectively produce the girl organs. But in reality, it's the ratio between the two that matters. So what you might expect is that if you're exposed to um, dibutyl phthalate, you might have a higher incidence of the diseases, the cryptorchidism, hyperspadia, that are caused by uh, these changes. Hyperspadias, for example, if you don't cause this fold to develop in exactly the right way because the ratio of these two is wrong, instead of forming a long straight urethra with a penis around the outside, it just forms a slightly invaginated uh, urethra, which is a bit more like the vagina. Very simplistic, this. But you can see it's sort of halfway there, uh, basically. So let's have a look what happened. And this is quite exciting because this paper just came out this morning. And I didn't know until this morning when somebody, the, I had an email actually from the publisher saying, your paper's just out, which couldn't be better, could it? So I changed my slide this morning and put that on. So it literally just came out in the New Zealand Medical Journal. What we did was, we looked at the Malaysian veterans, but we looked at their children and them, actually. We found no difference in them, but you wouldn't expect it because they weren't developing when they were exposed. But we looked at their kids. And these data were quite controversial, but again, now they're published. They're still controversial, but they, they're a bit more accepted if they've been through a publication system, peer review. Cryptorchidism in the normal New Zealand population, and I've only I've put just two years worth on here in our paper, a lot more. In 2000, the incidence was about 1.09% of the population. In 2005, it was about 0.91. So it's around about the same. In our war veterans' children, it was 5.2% which is quite interesting, isn't it? Very high. The, the problem, I have to come clean, the problem with these data, uh, you can't get round it, is that the numbers that we've got here, individuals, are quite small. And the reason they're quite small is that the, the men that we studied, a lot of them now died. And what, we, what we're going back now is to look at the children of even the people that died. Because we started our questionnaires with the, pet, with the fathers, asking them about their children. We're now going to the families and asking them about their children to get more numbers. But that's statistically highly significant. And if you look at hyperspadias in 2000, about 0.33, 2005, 0.3, so it doesn't change much, quite rare, 2.5%. So again, a significant uh, increase. Interestingly, breast cancer. We find this one quite hard to understand. The incidence of breast cancer here isn't the complete incidence. This is the incidence between 0 and 39 years. And we use those data because it would be unfair to use the data for an entire lifetime because all the women in the study that we had got, we, we did, were below 40. And so the only statistics we could find for that were in the States. And it shows that the incidence is about 0.48% of population. And we got 4% in our study. So that's also quite interesting. So what we think is happening, and I won't go into the details of this, is that the sperm are being affected on this occasion by the dibutyl phthalate by a process that we, we term epigenetics. And that change is being passed on when the sperm fertilizes an ovum, and it's affecting the developing child. We're now working on that genetics of it and looking at what happens by looking for markers and looking at these people with hyperspadias and, and testosterone uh, and testicular uh, problems to see if they've got the same marker present. But I won't go into the, the detail of that. But the breast cancer bit's quite important there. And that's the sort of link that I now want to segue into. And I want to look at the process of carcinogenesis and how this might fit in to that process of uh, carcinogenesis. It's a two-phase process. Just look at these two bits first, and we'll look at the rest of it in a minute. The, the initial process is initiation, when the DNA, the genes, are damaged in some way. That damage could be due to chemicals affecting the DNA, it could be like this, or it could be due to a genetic defect, i.e. you inherit it from your mum or from your dad, and the gene is all already defective because of inheritance. 
But the important thing is the process of promotion. If that DNA is damaged, it can't actually promulgate anything, you can't do anything until the DNA divides when the cell divides and then the two cells are damaged and they divide then the four are damaged and they divide and the eight are damaged, 16, 32, da, 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 on and on and on. And there are separate chemicals that cause promotion, i.e. cause the division to form that. And once you've begun the promotion process, then you can go down to uh, the cancer itself because that promotion will lead to more and more and more and more division and you'll get an area of um, cells that are damaged, uh, basically. And what I want to just explore a little bit as we go through the, the final bit of my talk today is the initiation and promotion and how the chemicals that we're talking about might fit into those two uh, categories. So let's have a look at oestrogens and breast cancer. I'm sure you all know this. I mean, many of you have, have, have had oestrogen receptor positive cancers or oestrogen receptor negative cancers, so you're better versed in this than me by a very long way. My mum was the expert on this subject. You know, she could, she could tell me the molecular structures of the bloody molecules that she was taking. I mean, I can believe it. And as she said, and I only worked in an office, son. <laughs> and I was quite impressed. I was going to bring her to some of my lectures at one stage. But if you look at a breast cancer cell with its oestrogen reception, and I've shown this on the surface, that's not necessarily correct. There's a, several places it can be, but just for ease, I'll put it on the surface. Here's an oestrogen molecule. The oestrogen molecule binds to the receptor on the surface, and it causes the cell to divide. That's the stimulus for this division. Feminization, make more female cells. Easy, simple, no problem. But if you, and that's promotion, if that DNA was damaged, then that damage has been promulgated by that promotion. So on this occasion, oestrogen is the promoter. But equally, if you have an oestrogenic compound that also fits into that receptor, that oestrogenic compound could also be a promoter. Not as good a promoter as oestrogen, absolutely right, but still a promoter. So if, if for example, and there's a, there's a lot I can't, haven't got time to talk about here. But if, for example, this tumour cell was sitting there during reproductive years, then it's going to be exposed to this all the time, and that's going to be happening. If, however, the tumour cell was sitting there in post-reproductive, post-menopausal years, then it wouldn't divide very easily or very well because the oestrogen stimulus is low. But if the stimulus from xenoestrogens or external oestrogens is there, it might initiate that, um, might promote that division. And that's probably where the oestrogenic compounds become important in breast cancer. It's in postmenopausal breast cancer. And as I'm sure you know, and we'll probably hear about this a little bit later on, exposure to chemicals that bind to this receptor, like in uh, hormone replacement therapy, where oestrogen or oestrogen analogues are given, is associated with an increase in breast cancer for just those reasons very obvious and it's exactly what you'd expect. Whether it's acceptable or not is the question, of course, that we have to ask. So is exposure to xenoestrogens a risk factor in breast cancer? That's, we're getting there. At last, you think, he's got there. I could have just come in at this stage. Why did I need all of that? But I think sort of giving some of that evidence gives you the idea of how these things work and that we know that they work like that. So the question is, of course, how much are we exposed to and could this amount cause breast cancer? And they're the big questions. And before you all get your notepads out, I'm not going to answer them because we actually don't know. We've got some ideas, but we really don't know yet. So you came for that, and you're not going to find out. Oh, dear. But let's ask the question first, are we exposed to them? And the answer is absolutely, categorically, definitely yes. And I've done a lot of studies over the years, and many other people have done more and better studies than I've ever done. But I'm just going to show you one study that I did, because it's quite a nice one, I think. I, I, say, I, I always say I did, don't I? I had nothing to do with it. It was a clever PhD student that did it. I just tagged along. And I write my name on the papers. You know. Actually, I did do some of the analysis in this one, and I even learned to speak Indonesian to do this bit of it, which was even funnier, uh, especially as it was a Muslim country, and Muslim ladies don't allow men anywhere near them, basically. And uh, it was quite difficult to talk to them about breast cancer and to talk to them about taking milk samples. So we had to have a lot of intermediates in this. We had so much fun, and I made so many good friends. And one of the friends is now a very good uh, Muslim friend in Indonesia who was the first person in this study. And uh, she's been to stay with us several times, and we have a very different relationship now to when we first started. What we did was we looked either in the literature or did some of the measurements ourselves 
uh, DDT levels. Now you might wonder why DDT. I've not told you this, but DDT is an estrogenic compound. It's about a millionth of the activity of the female hormone 17 beta estradiol, but it's a recognized estrogenic compound, well known. And a lot of other molecules which you'll see later that are pesticides are also known to be estrogenic. Now we use DDT here just as an indicator of exposure. We looked at a lot of others too, and they all have the same sort of pattern. But we just looked around the world at levels in human milk. And we looked at human milk for two reasons actually. One is because human milk is fatty, and these molecules are soluble in fat, therefore that's where we'd find them. It's non-invasive, it's easy to do. The, the study was actually also looking at growth and development in children and looking at kids' exposure to these molecules. And of course their exposure is high when they're only being fed milk. And so that was quite important from that point of view. But today I'm just showing it as evidence of exposure. And you can see in a country like the USA, where DDT is banned, it's banned around the world actually, but it's used in some places, the levels were, I say low, I don't know whether that's low or high, but they're that number. And that's the sort of value that you get in places where there's not much DDT. Looking at, I won't go through this all in detail, but this is quite interesting and irrelevant for our discussion today, but still interesting. Look at Germany. This was done in the times that we still had East and West Germany. And it's high in the East and low in the West. It's banned around the world, but East Germany didn't uphold the ban. And therefore, DDT was used, and so people were exposed. But if you look at the level in West Germany, which is higher than America, it's probably higher because there was some trading across the border in grain, and therefore the... DDT was transferred across the border. Isn't that interesting? You can look at politics through DDT levels in uh, women's milk. You're a very po politically active group, you know. Some of the levels around the world are incredibly high, and the highest uh, we found was uh, in our good friend, actually, uh, in Indonesia. And that illustrates exposure, which is the point I'm making uh, here. There's been, there's been a lot more work carried out since then, uh, not by me, by other people looking at the link between xenoestrogen, that's not very good spelling there, is it? Xenoestrogogogon. Uh, I, I said to someone today who said there's some water on the table, I prefer gin. I think I'd had one then. Or well, probably two, actually. And is there a link? And it's quite interesting because following on from the stuff that I just showed you where we showed that these chemicals are present in human milk, which means that women have been exposed to them, um, they did a lot more work and they looked at one of the metabolites of DDT, which is DDE. I won't go into the reasons for that, it doesn't matter, but it's also uh, estrogenic. Another molecule, Aldrin, which is another organochlorine pesticide, endosulfan, which New Zealand's just banned, actually, within the last 18 months, two years. And I'm delighted. Uh, I went to a New Zealand Food Safety Authority meeting and gave a talk on it and said, why do we still use this? And I actually got ridiculed by uh, Andrew McKenzie, who was the then director of the New Zealand Food Safety Authority. Why did you keep going on about this, he kept saying. And then they banned it, so obviously it did need to be gone on about a little bit. And another one, Lindane, which is banned pretty well around the, around the world. And this, TEX-B, which is a mixture of compounds, and basically you determine this by taking um, a sample, mashing it up, and putting it into a culture of MCF7 cells. Does anybody know what an MCF7 cell is? It's a human breast cancer cell. I culture these in my lab. And it was taken from a woman who died in the 1980s, and it's been cultured for very many years since. And it expresses the estrogen receptor on its surface. And if you expose it to estrogenic compounds, it divides, just for the reasons I said earlier. So you can measure levels of estrogenicity by the division of an MCF7 cell culture. And so what this group also did that's referenced here, they also took samples from women, mashed them up, and measured the estrogenicity. And what they found is that the levels of all of those and the degree of estrogenicity was higher in the adipose tissue, the fat, from breast cancer patients. Now, I haven't got enough time to go into the detail here. There's a lot of controversy about this. You can, you can read 20 papers, and 10 will say what a load of rubbish that is, and 10 will say how good it is. I think it's quite interesting. What they were showing was there appears to be a greater exposure in women that have got breast cancer. It doesn't mean it caused breast cancer, but it might. It might be one of the risk factors, and there are a lot of risk factors. It might be just one of them. But the thing that made me really interested, and I hadn't noticed this actually until the, the red I put on last night, because I was reading this paper saying I've got to get to grips with this. 
last night after I'd had my gin and tonic, actually. So was, I probably didn't read it properly. And it was particularly, this, it was particularly evident, and the authors make it clear, in postmenopausal women, which again fits in with what I'm saying before, that if you get an estrogenic compound exposure in postmenopausal women, there's more of a possibility of it having an effect than if it's in premenopausal uh, women. So that shows you that there is some degree of link between exposure to these chemicals, these estrogenic chemicals, and there are many more similar sort of studies than with breast cancer, and that's very interesting. Whether there's a cause and effect relationship there is something the jury's still very much out on. But I want to sort of finish off with the positive side of the story, I suppose, and talk a little bit about some of the treatments for breast cancer and then finish off with where we might be going in terms of preventing breast cancer. And you all know that one of the major treatments for breast cancer is tamoxifen. And tamoxifen, here's 17 beta estradiol. If you look at that now, you've got your Nobel Prize in chemistry, you would say that looks nothing like 17 beta estradiol. But if you're good like me with ChemDraw, you can draw anything in any shape you like. And if you superimpose estrogen on tamoxifen, you can see that there's a lineup of similar groups. That's, this might not look similar to you, but having a nitrogen there makes it hydrophilic, so that it attracts water, and it behaves in a similar way to this group. So you can see there's a similarity between the two. And if you look at the estrogen receptor crystallized in the presence of tamoxifen, you can see that tamoxifen sits in the estrogen receptor beautifully, and that the big chemical group actually sits across. You imagine the receptor as a sort of big spherical protein with a channel going down into it, and estrogen goes down into that channel and binds. What's happening here is tamoxifen is sitting with the bit of it bound in the channel and a block across the top of the channel, which stops estrogen going in. But the way tamoxifen works is it doesn't stimulate division. It simply blocks the estrogen receptor. So it prevents cells dividing. So we've just done an experiment, actually. One of my students, Christy, Christy Weber, is just beginning to culture MCF7 cells. And so, well, let's just try an obvious experiment to see if they're behaving properly. So she took some MCF7 cells. Lovely, they're growing beautifully. And she put some estrogen in, and they grew like crazy. I mean, you wouldn't believe how fast they grow. And then she did the same experiment, but she put tamoxifen in first, left it for a day, then put estrogen in, and they didn't grow. So it's you know, very, very clear. They did a little bit, actually, but not very much. It's very clear that it blocks the uh, effect. And since then, we've made other drugs. Raloxifene is an example. And you can see that this bit of the raloxifene molecule looks just like 17-beta, more like 17-beta estradiol than uh, tamoxifen. And the reason it looks more like it is by the time the pharmaceuticals industry had got to this stage, they understood how the estrogen receptor worked and said, well, we make something more like it. And so they did. And it's got this big blocking thing sticking on the side here, which stops the receptor functioning properly. So you can see how you can use some of this knowledge as well about how the receptors work uh, to all of our, particularly your, uh, benefits. This is a very long summary, but I just want to go through the story we've come through. And I hope the chemistry wasn't too tedious for you as we went through. So we basically live in a sea of estrogen. And that's kind of an issue. And it's an issue for all sorts of reasons. And one of the reasons, I think, is breast cancer. I think it's one of the risk factors. It doesn't cause it. It's a risk factor towards it. We know that exposure to these estrogenic compounds activates the estrogen receptor. And we know that because male feminization is evident. The sperm count's going down, and that's been shown in New Zealand within the last 18 months as well. Not surprisingly, but it was. Girls are reaching puberty earlier, as an example. And it looks like, or they are, estrogens are breast cancer promoters. So when I talked about the organochlorine pesticides, they're also promoters. But what I didn't tell you is they can also interact with DNA. So they could also be initiators as well. So they could actually be chemical carcinogens as well as promoters. So again, a little controversial, but there is the possibility of that. And there's a, some evidence and increasing that exposure to these sorts of chemicals is 
correlated with breast cancer. Not necessarily causes breast cancer, but is correlated with it. And I must emphasize that because a lot of, I would be very remiss if I led you to believe that that's been proved, because it hasn't. I'm laboring that too much, but I don't want you to go away with the wrong impression there. Breast cancer rates are just beginning to decline, which is damn good news. And it might be because we've now got under control some of the environmental pollutants. You know, we're banning some chemicals, DDT, for example. A lot of the organochlorine pesticides are now banned. We might just be reaping the benefits of that decline. So our environmental vigilance might be beginning to be paid off. Got to be careful, though, because we're making lots of new things now. We're making things in different parts of the world, like China, where the manufacturing processes might not be as good. They might not be as vigilant. Also, in those countries, the environmental regulations are zero. And they're putting a whole lot of stuff down their rivers and into the sea. And we're not far over the sea. And we're also beginning to import food from China and India. And that food might well be contaminated with the chemicals that they're putting out in there. So we've got to be a bit careful here. We've cleaned our own environment up beautifully, but we're just beginning to reply, uh, rely on other people's environments, which are really not clean and, in fact, are filthy. So we've got to be very, very careful about that. Very negative statement, risky statement, dangerous statement, but I think it's true. So what we need to be able to do is control our exposure to xenoestrogens because I think that might reduce the incidence of breast cancer. Now that control is quite nicely underway at the moment because the food regulations are there, making sure that we're not exposed to things that are regarded as estrogenic, and also import regulations are there. But we've just got to watch what's happening overseas. And finally, I think we've got to look much more carefully at the evidence for estrogenicity. And I'll leave you just with the two pieces of information that are really important. The European Union recently looked at estrogenicity with a view to regulating estrogenic chemicals. And they said, but we can only look at individual chemicals. So they chose BPA as the first example. They looked at it. They did all these studies, looked at the literature, and said there is not sufficient evidence to show that exposure to that one molecule can cause any harm in people. And they're right, because there isn't. But of course, these chemicals don't work alone. They work together. They all fit the same receptor, and they add up. So that's a stupid thing to do. But it's the only thing the regulators can do, because they can only regulate individual compounds. So America then said, well, we'll look at that too. And they began to look at it. And the Americans, the FDA, is a very good authority, very decisive, do fantastic studies. Just Google FDA and bisphenol A, and you'll get a huge amount of documentation or genistain as well, actually, and non-alphenol. And they went away, and they took two years, and they came back again, and I was waiting for the result to see if they agreed with Europe, to see if there's going to be fisticuffs between the two. And they came back and said, it's a bit difficult. We're going to need longer. It's the first time I've ever heard the American authorities say that, and I think it's because they're clever. And I think they're realizing you can't make a definitive decision on that individual compound, and the system is so much more complex that they've got to think how you can regulate it before they come up with a decision. New Zealand's sitting on the fence. That's not a negative comment about New Zealand. We have to. We're waiting to see what America decides. We can't ban things unilaterally. If we did, we wouldn't be able to use anything because no country is going to <coughs> manufacture its plastics or whatever to suit our needs. So we have to sit there and wait and see what the rest of the world does. But I think it's an area we should be looking at and we should just be gently campaigning around just to keep it in the... Um, purview of our political friends in, in the beehive. Thank you for listening. <laughs>